Since the first port was built on the U.S. coastline in the 17th century, longshoremen, workers who load and unload cargo from ships, have played an essential role in maritime trade. However, until the late 20th century, they were subject to hazardous working conditions and a substandard pay. Following the progressive era in the early 1900s, industrialization brought thousands of job opportunities. Though more cargo could be loaded and shipped faster than ever, beneath this frenzy were the longshoremen, who, exhausted by their company's denial of basic rights, decided to unite and fight for justice once and for all. The 1934 longshoremen's strike marked the definitive turning point of West Coast waterfront history as longshoremen explored the power of labor unions by shutting down Pacific maritime trade. Despite violent encounters with law enforcement and opposition from the media, the longshoremen ultimately gained union recognition and control of hiring halls. A Wave of Change the 1934 West Coast Waterfront Strike by Ashley Ludi, Ananya Jain, and Eileen Jong. The Great Depression of 1929 led to a severe decrease in wages for longshoremen, who were paid $10 a week, one-third of the average wage for coal miners. Work was exhausting, lasting up to 36 consecutive hours, and injured longshoremen were afraid to ask for compensation. In the employer-controlled hiring halls, longshoremen were forced to fight like animals for shifts, and some even resorted to bribery. You could see the faces in the eyes of the men saying, I hope it's me, and sometimes if you were hungry enough, you'd scream out to the boss. That's how hard and miserable they made the human race on this waterfront. Moreover, when workers protested their treatment by joining workers' unions, they were put onto a coast-wide blacklist. Around 1900, most longshoremen had joined the International Longshoremen's Association, or ILA. In previous ILA strikes, like the 1919 Seattle General Strike, employers used the workers' lack of organization across the coast to their advantage, hiring longshoremen from other locals and bringing cargo in through neighboring ports. The federal ratification of the National Industrial Recovery Act in June of 1933, allowing workers to join unions and assemble, rekindled the hope of West Coast longshoremen. Led by Harry Bridges, an ILA member, they decided to explore their powers through a coast-wide strike which would revolutionize Pacific waterfront history. The 1934 waterfront strike commenced on May 9th and lasted 83 days. All major West Coast ports were shut down as over 12,000 longshoremen protested for better working conditions, higher wages, union recognition, and control over hiring halls. But the longshoremen encountered immediate backlash. Employers believed that they were merely calling for attention in an unnecessary strike. The more there wasn't a union that would stand up for higher wages, the greater it benefited the employers. Within the, the structure of capitalism, our business, they were trying to make extra money with profits. And since there was no workers organized in order to try to have a democratic form of, uh, of control for the workers in the workplace, they weren't able to counter it. At the time, the Russian Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 was still fresh in American minds. Connections between longshoremen and the Communist Party created widespread fear that the strikers were communists, preparing to infiltrate the U.S. government. However, they weren't affiliated with any organization. They were just part of this union movement to improve their conditions. But everyone around the country, because of the propaganda, believed that this was an army of communists. Working with politicians and the press, the employers strove to spread these negative messages across the coast. On July 3, 1934, the Industrial Association, working with Governor Merriam of San Francisco, sent police and National Guard troops to break the pickets and force the ports open at San Francisco. Violent encounters erupted as mounted police drove in with clubs, carload after carload, armed with more tear gas and shotguns. The superiority of the uniformed forces was too much for any human. Trucks and cars were overturned and windows shattered. This became known as the Battle of Rincon Hill. On Thursday the 5th, now known as Bloody Thursday, the ports were forced open once again, but to greater consequence. The rioting that day resulted in the deaths of seven strikers, including two in San Francisco. 
Upon encountering the violence and death caused by police brutality, the public, who had once demonized the strikers, turned to support the longshoremen. I think the crucial element in the longshore success in 34 was in getting the public to understand their cause. That was the decisive event, was the burial of those who were killed. And, and public opinion actually decides who wins the strikes. A massive funeral march was held on July 9th. 40,000 men, women, and children walked solemnly with the coffins in the air. R.S. Clampett wrote in the San Francisco Chronicle, In life, they wouldn't have commanded a second glance on the streets of San Francisco, but in death, they were born the length of Market Street in a stupendous and reverent procession that astounded the city. On July 14th, the ILA and San Francisco Labor Council organized a general strike of all industries. The streets were packed with over 100,000 defiant workers. After unanimously voting on arbitration, strike leaders decided to end the general strike four days later. The 1934 waterfront strike came to a close as workers along the coast returned to work on July 31st. On October 12, 1934, President Roosevelt's National Longshoremen's Board arbitrated with the ILA, finally granting the workers a six-hour day, which previously lasted up to 36 consecutive hours and a higher wage of 95 cents per hour. Additional negotiations took place to settle final demands, and by the spring of 1935, the Union was given control of the hiring halls. The significance of this victory was evident on the one-year anniversary of Bloody Thursday, when the Waterfront Worker, a newspaper dedicated to inspiring unionism amongst longshoremen, wrote, The martyrs of the 1934 strike have not given their lives in vain. The better conditions, the strengthening of all waterfront unions, are glorious and solid gains that have come to the maritime workers. But Bridges knew that the struggle for justice was far from over. He spent the next 20 years organizing longshoremen under the new International Longshore and Warehouse Union, or ILWU. Bridges emphasized his no-discrimination policy, hiring African Americans, women, and workers of other minorities. His ideology made the ILWU a democratic union which took the idea of solidarity further than any union at the time. By 1937, most longshoremen had left the corruption of the ILA in favor of the ILWU, and a new era of prosperity followed for the waterfront workers. The basic underpinnings of the ILWU has not changed. Post the 1934 strike on July 5th, every year, uh, the West Coast shuts down to honor Bloody Thursday. So the values, the recognition, the understanding is done on the entire West Coast. With the strike victory and coastwide contract, the ILWU increased in both size and strength to stand as tall as it is today. The 1934 waterfront strike empowered workers and their unions, inspiring a series of future successful strikes. In 1971, the longshoremen fought for job security in the midst of political and economic turmoil, refusing to settle for less than their demands. Taking inspiration and drawing strength from their predecessors in 1934, the workers earned the right to stable work and guaranteed pay. In addition, port slowdowns in 2002, and most recently, 2015, resulted in victory. In the decades preceding 1934, labor unions failed to gain the strength needed to protect workers' rights. The working class, the foundation of America's economy, encountered inhumane treatment and gained little recognition. The waterfront strike proved the power of a labor union dedicated to a specific industry. By exploring the idea of a coastwide strike, the longshoremen were able to embrace solidarity and form a united front to resist the employer's control. They provided, more importantly, an extreme extreme positive example um, to inspire a wave of worker organizing afterwards. That wave, they they saw it almost as a, a cause, right? It wasn't just, it was a labor movement. Into the 1950s, unionism and the labor movement continued to gain momentum, allowing workers to organize and strike freely. 
In 1934, the longshoremen risked their lives as they joined together, exploring the potential of labor unionism in a strike so powerful it forever changed the West Coast.